Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Meditation, well, it's on everybody's bucket list, or at the very least on many people's things I must do list. It's a subject we have covered on a few occasions. Uh, go back and have a listen to the episode with Dr. Shankadev Saraswati a few months ago. Well, my guest today is Tom Cronin. Tom has developed several programs around Vedic meditation, which used to be referred to as Transcendental Meditation. Tom is a man on a mission, and as you will hear, he's got many things going. One of those things is a new film coming out in the next week or so called The Portal. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing that. He also has many other projects to encourage people, young and old, to make meditation accessible, achievable, and doable in their lives. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Tom Cronin. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, thanks for inviting me along. It's great to be here. Tom, your project, The Portal, looks amazing, the book, the film, and we're obviously going to be talking about that. But um, your background is a fascinating one because, uh, you know, we talk a lot about stress. I know you talk a lot about stress. And yet, and your background was in a pretty stressful situation. I wonder if you might share that with our listener. Yeah, yeah, I was a broker on a trading room floor and I started out in 1987, which was the height of the sort of, you know, big market sort of booming, you know, with lots of debt in the world. And it's kind of eventuated to another place these days with lots of debt again. But, you know, back then in 1987, the markets were frenetic, they were fast paced, and I was a young 19 year old. And walked onto a massive trading room floor of, you know, 150 predominantly guys yelling and screaming, trading all sorts of different moving markets from currencies to swaps and bonds and cash and bills and electricity and wool and futures. So it was pretty frenetic and it was exciting. It was dynamic and it was adrenaline pumped. But what happens in that environment is you uh, pretty much sustaining for long periods of time that fight flight response, which is that sympathetic nervous system state mm. or S for stress response. And, uh, you know, over time that starts to, uh, leave, you know, quite significant sort of marks on you, on your body, you know, like symptoms that start showing up as to the anomaly that's being incurred through this state for long periods of time. And that was anxiety, insomnia, and panic attacks, and eventually depression and, some agoraphobia, which is the inability to leave the house, had to leave my job for a while. So it got quite dramatic after a period of time. Wow. I mean, at 19 now, Tom, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, you're pretty f- resilient physically, one would hope at that point, but uh, not the case. Well, you know, interestingly, at 19, I was, you know, just finished backpacking around the world and was supposed to do a degree in journalism at Macquarie University. But, uh, you know, I just applied for a bunch of jobs in the paper after having spent most of my money backpacking and hadn't really <clears throat> anticipated going into finance, certainly not in broking. But, you know, at 19, things were great. I was ripping along, you know, 20, 21, 22. But over time, this deterioration, and it wasn't just through the nature of the job, you know, I, I added a lot of other factors to this you know at night time I was you know got into the whole club scene and doing a lot of drugs a lot of drinking and being up till sort of three four in the morning most weeknights and then weekends when most of my colleagues were either doing a round of golf or sailing on the yachts or sleeping <clears throat> sitting on the sofa watching tv you know I was out in raves uh, in the sort of the warehouse party scene of the late 80s early 90s I don't know if anyone remembers that but <laughs> well if they um, do they weren't there isn't that the experience yeah that's right so you know it was it was not like my body had any rec- recruitment time there was you know I was I was the one causing a lot of this problem yeah it wasn't and necessarily just the workload yeah I mean that time you know it's kind of the stock market floor people running around with tickets in their hands I mean computers hadn't actually happened then uh, not to that not at any great degree anyway and that whole scenario um, must um, it, physically the physicality of it as well running around and 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 getting orders in a very different world to what it must be now. Not that it's any less stressful now. Yeah, I mean, I actually wasn't on the floor. So there was a futures floor and a stock market floor, and then it did go digitalize both the futures and the stock market. I was on a, a on a trading room floor for swaps and bonds and cash, and that was predominantly done on these very clunky. They were just the early days of the computers. They were big sort of clunky boxes that sitting on desks, and we had big 
squawk boxes on top of those computers. And we had orders yelling at us from traders in investment banks, domestic banks all around the world, giving us buy and sell orders for 5 mil, 10 mil, 20 mil, 100 mil worth of tickets. Um, you know, it's mind boggling, isn't it? These yeah, kind of, yeah. And you're, you're and in this kind of tribe of people where yeah. that kind of behavior is just normalized. Yeah, and you know what? It's interesting. The computers have changed. Obviously, they're a lot slimmer now, but the the markets themselves and the nature of that market still quite the same. If you go onto a trading room floor, there's my old company. You can still go onto that, and um, a lot of guys are still there doing a similar sort of job. Um, big, you know, groups of people um, trading these these um, different products around the world. Because when people work in an environment, it's kind of it's their tribe. You know, it's what has become the way of life for that. And I can imagine in that kind of environment, this is just the way it is. I mean, you know, this is what we do. This is what a working life is like. Yeah, and essentially you use the word tribe. It's quite tribal in some respect as well because, you know, you're competing against other brokers for that business. And so, you know, it is a very much us and them and win-lose mentality, which we touch on in the film um, a little bit about the systems that have become established in our society, which is this win-lose paradigm based on tribal culture. It's so interesting. You know, I I was talking to somebody on the podcast a few months ago and and I never had really thought of um, evolutionary theory as being political, but, you know, this survival of the fittest model that we've kind of all grown up with in the West, the Darwinian, Darwinian model, is a really powerful metaphor for the capitalist system, isn't it? Uh, it even transcends, even be- goes beyond the capitalist system. It goes into the school, the sporting. Mm. You know, schools are ranked for NAPLAN, and that's yep. a, it's yep. a that's a win lose paradigm. With in sports, every weekend, we know we go and cheer team on that one's going to win, one's going to lose. Um, it's survival of the fittest in nearly every area. Of, you know, real estate agents competing against each other, radio stations competing against each other, TV stations competing against each other. Um, that's really the the inbuilt culture that's been established for over thousands of years. Mm. That's the beauty of doing this podcast, Tom. We're not in competition with anybody. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but the interesting alternative to that is the idea of synergy. Because, you know, when you think about evolution, when two cells got together, there was synergy and they formed something greater than the one cell and then that formed something more complex, etc. So survival of the fittest is one way of looking at evolution, but synergy is really the way it all happened. And, and it kind of leads us down a very different path. But I want to, I would just want to get back to the, your, you, you'd reached a point, obviously, where physically, and I'm guessing you were now only in your mid twenties. <laughs> Is that right? Uh- me now personally? No, no, not now. No, when you when career, you went, yeah, yeah. Um, it, things started to go quite, uh, you know, around sort of twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, and then things hit rock bottom around twenty eight, twenty nine. Mm. Yeah, because that was when the the wear and tear started to really impact the body after a good eight years of doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, and, and honestly, when you get to that age of twenty eight, I mean, you're getting a really long. I mean, isn't it funny? You probably thought you were old at twenty eight, and uh, reflecting back, you probably feel younger now than you did then. Oh, absolutely. I feel, you know, I'm 52 now. I'm fitter and stronger and healthier than I've ever been. Um, but that's just simply a, a very shifting dynamic in the way I live my life, the way I think, the yeah. way my brain functions. But at 28, 29, you know, it's, uh, I always, um, put forward that the symptoms are really just the mechanism that the body has to give you an indication that you need to change what you're doing. Yeah. And, and so at that point, you had, And as happens for a lot of people, it often takes a crisis of some sort to force change. And I want to talk to you about what, what, what brings on change, but there was a crisis. What, where were, what was your physical mental state at that point? Yeah, the crisis was quite intense. It it had gotten to a point of, we talk about this in the film, a a rash is a, a, is a, is a point where the, you're meeting at a fork in the road and your current trajectory, the current path can no longer be sustained. It has to be one way or the other, which is a breakdown or breakthrough. And so that crisis for me looked like extreme, extreme panic attacks, just waves of fear and dread, which were incredibly debilitating and crippling, a lot of anxiety, uh, a lot of feeling, a deep sense of hopelessness. You know, my biochemistry at this point was completely de- depleted of melatonin and serotonin and oxytocin the biochemicals for sleep and happiness and love and um just a, a lot of adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine and just feeling um very very lost very very dark very very 
hopeless, I guess, was a, a bleakness and hopelessness about it all. Just the crippling anxiety and panic attacks were just, um, yeah, very mm. brutal. I mean, I really like that expression, uh, Tom, you know, break down or break through. So what was the breakthrough? That's what happened, obviously. You're here now. Um, what, what's the, yeah, what was the no, breakthrough? At 28. Yeah, it was, a, it was a big shift, a significant shift. You know, at that point, I had been sent to psychiatrists and doctors and put on pharmaceutical drugs and told that I was having a, a bit of a mental breakdown. Um, but it was at that time that, uh, you know, I found meditation and it was quite a significant shift. Like literally within a week of me learning that technique, I started to get not just incredibly excited about a new possibility for the way I live my life, but to have these experiences of immense restfulness and inner peace that was starting to be experienced through the practice was like, it was phenomenal what I'd been looking for seemingly in other areas of my research, you know, drugs and alcohol and parties and clubs. Um, I started to find in this incredible solitude and silence that I found in the meditation. And not in a very long time. I mean, a week is hardly what you would describe as a long time. It takes a lot of medications, if they work at all, a lot longer to work than that. Oh, that's what blew me away. I was just, I just couldn't believe that this was not a mainstream technique that the world was embracing because it was just. And I, I, I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful teacher that had a lot of uh, sort of scientific background behind him as a neuroscientist. So you know he shared with us the you know the understanding about the body and the biochemistry and sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and you know i i was just blown away that the simple technique of getting the body out of sympathetic nervous system and into the parasympathetic nervous system that's the peace and the rest and digest state uh, and how much change starts to happen when the body gets into that state and that's what was really happening to me so yeah i became a very big fan and advocate of meditation, much to the annoyance of a few people in my local vicinity at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tempting when you reach that, when you find that epiphany to become yeah. very evangelical. Yeah. It's a great way of alienating all your friends and family, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but what was it? I mean, there are so many different, um, you know, types of meditation. I mean, I, I know you go into We're going to go into what the film is about, and I know you trace some stories here, and I want to explore that. But for you personally, in this instance, what was the kind of meditation that you followed? Yeah, I did do a lot of research. You know, I tie kicked a lot of different techniques. I really wanted to know the ins and outs of all the different meditations out there before I kind of really settled on one. And, and um, but I did come across this transcendental meditation. It's now called, or partly called, Vedic meditation. There's two different groups teaching the same thing. Um, and so at the time, it was transcendental meditation, and it was. The ability to go, uh, what I really liked about was this transcending uh, capability, the ability to actually go beyond, and that's what transcend means, to go beyond thinking, go beyond the limitations of physical and emotional forms as well. And that experience was quite profound and quite unique for two reasons. One is that the level of physiological rest um, was incredible because it allowed my body to start restoring a lot of balance during that deep rest achieved in the transcendent experience. But it's also because it gives you access to this state of awareness, this state of uh, consciousness that isn't polluted with the thinking process. So you're aware and you're awake, but you're not having a thought. And that's quite a profound state to experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've, I've explored the TM, uh, you know, area as well. I mean, meditation is for so many people on their to-do list, isn't it? Yeah, it's becoming more so just out of the need of the time. Our mm. nervous systems are more and more stimulated and we're becoming more and more stressed, really. What, what do you think some of the impediments are? What's holding people back? Uh, look, you know, we've created incredibly charming lives. We think it's kind of normal to have Uber Eats and Uber and Zara and, you know, Netflix and, uh, you know, pubs that we can go and drink as much as we want and food we can eat as much we want. And, you know, it's it's an incredibly charming life. We've got Instagram and Facebook. So there's a lot of things pulling our attention outside of us that uh, is very luring for the mind and our nervous system and our emotional state. Um, and so that's something that, uh, you know, the reason why Buddhist monks will go into renunciant states and pull away from all of those distractions because it is a, a very charming proposition that the life we've created and becoming more so. So that's what's m making probably number one, the most challenging part about going within and turning their back and their attention, their senses away from all of those things. But also 
time. People say that they don't have the time because they're filling their life up with all of those charming things that they don't feel that they can park something aside to make space for meditation, which is the antithesis of what they're doing out there, which is being charmed by the outer world. Mm -hmm. Now, it it led you, obviously, this film that's coming out. Now, tell us a little bit about it. It's called The Portal, but but how did it come about? And let's talk a little bit about the film itself. Yeah, I created an online meditation program, which was kind of like a world's first. It had never been done before. I I did disrupt a little bit of the sort of the TM model and put uh, a style of meditation into an online format. And we really felt a great way to share this technique with the world and let people know about the power of meditation was to make a, a film about it. So rather than making a film that just talked about meditation and we interviewed scientists and meditation teachers. Rather than doing that, what we wanted to do was show the power of meditation through personal stories. So we researched about 300 personal stories that it all had. It had to have three components to the story. One was that it had to have a crisis. One was that they had to use meditation to move through that crisis. And and thirdly, that they had to have a sort of a global appeal in the story, the nature of their story, so that everyone in the world could relate to one of the stories in the film in some way, shape or form. So we scoured the world for those stories and found uh, we them down to about six and we've found um, these amazing, compelling stories that have all um, really had an incredible transformation using the power of meditation. Can you share a teaser of one of them with us? Yeah, we've got um, – I'll, I'll share a couple of them. Okay. We've got Zway. I didn't want to yeah. spoil the film. No, but no. didn't no, want to no, be no. a spoiler, but uh, if They're you can share – They're on the website. Yeah, yeah, sure. great. So we've got Zue, who's uh, a Vietnamese refugee that, uh, you know, came across to America on a refugee boat and nearly died in the early stages of her life. And she eventually, after living a very um, uh, challenging childhood in a very poor area of Philadelphia, won a scholarship to Harvard, thinking that that was the ticket out of, you know, her problems. But that's when her problems really started because she noticed not just through the immense pressure of the, the degree that she was doing, but the big difference between her and the privileged elite that she was living her life with. She felt incredibly isolated and alienated and suffered quite immense depression and suicidal tendencies at Harvard. Um, we've got a wonderful, beautiful uh, African-American soldier that had PTSD from his time uh, serving the USA in war. Um, we've got a, a uh, American track athlete, Heather, who... Uh, broke her back after just winning the nationals at the 800 meter championships and um, about to head off to the Olympics and winning lots of scholarships at some of the top unis in America. And then literally a few weeks later, broke her back jumping off a cliff at Lake Tahoe. And um, James Doty, who um, was an entrepreneur that lost $75 million in the tech crash. Uh, Amandine, who's a wonderful United Nations human rights lawyer, uh, suffered extreme PTSD after serving the UN in places like Afghanistan and Syria and became a yoga meditation teacher after discovering the power of meditation to move through her trauma and PTSD. Um, so, yeah, there's one other little, one big, beautiful story. But we'll keep it, that one quiet because uh, we reveal that one in the film, which is very exciting. Okay. Well, you've covered a few bases there, haven't you? Because, I mean, um, uh, alienation. I mean, you know, mental health is a huge and growing problem in our society. And the irony is that, um, you know, we're connected with the world, with friends and likes and all of that, but we're not connecting with the person sitting right next to us. And and that's complicated even more, I guess, by being a refugee and an, and an immigrant. But you don't even have to be that to be alienated and uh, and lonely and depressed, do you? Yeah, you know, I was at a sheer restaurant just the other day and I was watching in that restaurant, there were three different couples sitting in that restaurant and at different tables and none of them were engaged with each other. They're all playing games or scrolling through feeds on their phones. And it's not to judge them in any way, but just to observe where our society is heading and what we consider to be integration and communication and, you know, spending time with each other at some Things are definitely changing, and yeah, I think we're seeing increased levels of loneliness in our world. Because mm. meditation is not in this; things aren't new, are they? They've been around for a while. Can you give us a little bit of a potted history of you know, meditation? You know, like wh- when did it all start? Because it's it's an ancient 
practice. Yeah, it goes back for thousands of years. I mean, the, the Bhagavad Gita explores a lot about meditation, and that was written, gosh, around 3,000 years ago, and it starts in these ancient times. You know, we're talking five to 10,000 years of people knowing that when you quiet your mind using whatever the technique you want to use, what different meditation styles, there is a, a level of awareness and blissfulness and lovingness and deep serenity that prevails. And, um, you know, it's only now that these techniques are going from being renunciation sort of remote regions to mainstream where people are starting to go, well, I want to experience that as well. You know, um, only the other day I was teaching a, a billionaire guy that had sold his businesses and is a very successful person in what we would consider successful in today's world, but was incredibly unhappy because he would ticked all the boxes that he thought he was supposed to tick family, wife, beautiful house, no debt, you know, lots of money. And yet, uh, according to what's perceived to be the, you know, all the boxes you're supposed to tick, it, it didn't give him the fulfillment he thought he should be experiencing. And that left him with a deep sense of lack. And so that's when he starts looking for meditation to look within and find what's inside himself. And so we're really seeing this come out of ancient traditions and religions like Hinduism or Buddhism or even not that it's a religion but the, the Vedic sort of traditions and into corporations and households of the world and that's a really exciting time that we're starting to see this transition into humanity basically realizing their fullest potential. So so the film tracks these five or six actually people mm. through their through their crisis through their through their meditation and um and follows their story to redemption almost i mean you know breakthrough break breakdown yeah. or breakthrough <laughs> yeah you know we, we want to follow the um oh, what's the the film model that you you know the the hero's journey yeah. um so you know it's the there's the the setup which is their life story and the conditioning and the programming and then there's the the crisis and the dark night of the soul and then there's the redemption where they take the the elixir back to humanity and uh yeah it's we really wanted to sort of try and fit it in that sort of template of what films generally are made of hmm. and what what if people because the or the other confusion not confusion but the other thing is mindfulness versus meditation what's what's the difference yeah you know i think that's subjective you know I, i'll give you my interpretation of it and i'm sure some listeners might have a different one and i respect that and appreciate it um i'm all for open discussion around these things but my interpretation of these two is that I meditate when I have my eyes closed and I look to withdraw my sensory world. I look to withdraw my mind's attention to the inner space where there's uh, silence and stillness. So if you think of silence and stillness, it's the absence of noise and motion. So that's always there. It's just that it's like the blue sky is always there. It's just that sometimes there's these clouds sort of masking over the top. Um, so that's what I consider meditation. And then mindfulness is what I do outside of that eyes closed experience. That is, how am I eating my food? How am I brushing my teeth? What thoughts am I entertaining while I'm driving my car? Um, how am I speaking? Am I speaking quickly or am I speaking slowly? So it's being aware in the moment of what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, who I'm doing it with, um, the you know very conscious interaction with the world. Hmm. I've also heard it said that twenty minutes of meditation is equivalent to two hours of sleep. Is that have you followed that at all? Yeah, and that will depend on the meditation. And some teachers will even say, and some science will even say, it's equivalent to four hours worth of sleep. And that's just the profound state of metabolic rest that is experienced when the mind is still, and yet the mind is awake so we can have mind being still but mind being asleep and that's what we do at night and then the mind being still and the mind being awake so it's conscious and alert so if someone clicks their fingers or opens the door you'll actually hear it instantaneously but being in that state of deep restfulness mentally leads to a profoundly deep state of physiological rest and that's where the body starts to really restore balance mm -hmm. so the film the film's coming out soon is it not yeah, when's so when's the start out, date? When's the launch date? Launches nationally on October 17th. There are some Q&As uh, that will be touring around Australia um, in Sydney uh, starting on the 10th, and then we go around the capital cities for Q&As. But nationally it does start on the 17th. 
Mm. And if people were kind of, you know, as I said, it's on a lot of people's to-do list, meditation, um, and they were wanting to get started, I mean, apart from going online, obviously, and doing your online course, mm. what would you rec- – how would you tell them, you know, to get going? Yeah, look, I, you know, people say, should I start, you know, just doing a couple of minutes a day, doing some breathing and stuff? Look, my best recommendation is always if you're going to do it, do it the best way possible. Do it so that you really immerse yourself in it rather than do it so that it's kind of ah, neither here nor there and you don't really have a good experience because there's a good chance you may never go back to it if you don't get a great experience. So I do recommend finding a teacher and finding a style that you resonate with and there are many different styles of meditation. I choose to use one and teach one because I found that the most effective for me personally. But I don't want to discriminate and, um, and I guess um, – influence people too much i think it's about doing your own research there are so many different techniques and so many different teachers in those techniques and you might resonate with one teacher more than another teacher in one particular technique of meditation so um look there's you know we've got this wonderful gift called google um and you know look look for techniques and teachers that you resonate with styles that you feel you you know some people love the breath buddhist style meditations for passionate style meditations as opposed to the mantra based transcending meditations and i respect that as well so um i'm here to just suggest a find a professional that's qualified in that space to really support you in that learning so that you really understand the theory and the prac around the experience uh and that's what we teach is that it needs to have the experience but also a lot of theory that comes with a lot of people just jumping on apps and learning from books, et cetera, or watching YouTube videos. But uh, I recommend having a lot of supporting information that comes with learning that technique because you, what you're talking about is you're talking about your mind, you're talking about your consciousness, you're talking about your physiology, and it's going to start to you know, change all of that if you're going to start meditating. Mm. TM is very much a mantra-based um, meditation, is it not? Yes, that's right. You'll get a, a sound or a mantra that has it, – it's basically – works as a device to take the mind in the direction that it doesn't normally tend to go in and that's inward as opposed to outward so the mantra just has an a it's a simplifying effect that has the ability to take the mind yeah into the quieter states away from stimulation and and are there a, a, a finite no i mean a number of mantras to draw from like are there five ten twenty or is it just kind of an arbitrary sound yeah, no, they're definitely specific mantras that they would use in the TM or Vedic meditation or primordial sound sort of, um, you know, um, areas. And they are called Bij mantras, B-I-J-A, and that's a mantra that has the ability to take the mind into transcendence. There's lots of mantras out there, thousands of mantras, but not all of them are transcending mantras like Om Namah Shivar or Om Mani Padmiham are mantras, but not for the purpose of transcendence, that is to f- surrender the mantra altogether in, in that deep state. Um, so with the Vedic um, transcending style of meditation, there's, I think, uh, roughly around sort of 20, 30 that mm. they uh, choose based upon their age group. And is it a sound that has to be made um, physically or is it just a silent sound in your own head? Yeah, it's a silent sound. So what's <laughs> happening with the mantra is it's taking the mind away from the world of form and phenomenon. And so... Um, for that reason, we don't want the mantra to be too established as itself a form or phenomenon. Otherwise, we'll get trapped into that world of, you know, thinking objects and things. So the mantra is very subtle and it's, uh, has a no English sort of connotation to it. So the mind doesn't really have the ability to grasp onto something with that mantra. It's more of a, um, a device that sort of sinks the mind into sort of these deeper delta brainwave frequencies. Hmm. So the resonance of the yeah. internal sound is the yep. key, and and the mantra bringing your attention when you because I guess one of the challenges in meditation is the mind, and it's the one of the challenges in life actually. But uh, certainly for the twenty minutes or so <laughs> of meditation, the mind is a big challenge, isn't it? Yeah, the mind doesn't want to not think. I mean, the mind loves thinking. It's the one of the most fascinating and <clears throat> exciting propositions for the mind is to analyze, process, worry, get angry project reject you know it's just caught up in that whole process of being engaged so um that's why it makes it a lot easier using a mantra because it's something that we put 
in front of the mind as a like a carrot in front of a donkey. It makes it a lot more effortless and easier to get the mind to do something it simply doesn't want to do. It doesn't want to not think. But if you can lead it to something that's incredibly blissful and charming, which is the state of transcendence, then the mind will spontaneously let go of thinking because it's found this incredibly blissful and satiating experience. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, this, uh, I mean, it's fantastic. And it's something that I know is everybody that you speak to uh, says, oh, yeah, I've got to, I've got to be, do- I've tried, I've tried it. I'm going to do it. I'm getting back mm-hmm. into it. So, Tom, I will say you've got so much stuff on and we hear so much about uh, youth mental health, you know, particularly teen mental health. And, and you've got a program, teen program. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I've got a teen program called Chill Out Meditation, which is really an adapted version of an ancient sort of practice of kind of like a Vedic meditation where they, they get their own mantra or they get a mantra for sort of a youth sort of age group. And it really takes them through 14 days of meditating for 14 minutes a day. And it's just to help them really get into the rhythm of embracing that time out. And, you know, with children, I've got teenagers myself and, you know, it's so difficult for these young kids to, um, to know how to get time out. In fact, they don't know how to do it. And, the, you know, any, every single spare moment they're filling up with their phones and Snapchat and Instagram. And so uh, this just helps them compartmentalise a little bit of mental rest, I guess, mental time out. I think, what, yeah, you've got teenage children. It's interesting because we had uh, a psychologist, Jodie Lowinger, on last year from the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, and she shared with me a statistic that, really shocked me. I mean, my kids are in their 30s, kids. Um, anyway, they're in their 30s. And um, and she said one in four uh, pe- uh, people under the age, te- uh, children under the age of 18 are diagnosed with either uh, anxiety or depression. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, the, <laughs> what we are doing, we are literally testing and trialling like guinea pigs on our children of the world. Uh, a new a new era of you know cellular phones information overload um you know narcissism through you know instagram likes and facebook fans and friends um just ems wi-fi modems uh you know radiation from phones <laughs> this is completely uncharted territory yeah i mean navigating that as a parent of a young, you know, of a teenager or even younger now, um, is real is a huge challenge. I mean, the can the the need to be connected constantly is is just mind boggling, literally mind boggling. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. I noticed that as well. You know, how do you navigate and, that with your kids? Yeah, look, it's difficult. You know, I mean, I've, they're very different. My two children, they're twins. Uh, one's a boy, one's a girl. And my daughter likes just to spend hours reading and doing art and walking the dog. And you know, she's she's very much into. Whereas my son's very social. You know, much, she's much more introverted. Whereas my son's very social, so he's literally just constantly with friends, messaging friends, and wanting to be engaged with people in some way, shape, or form. And if it's not in person, then it's through the medium of a of a of a, a cell phone. So. Um, you know, we we try to emphasize the importance of time out and uh, a lot of it's just letting them explore themselves and work out, you know, how that how things are working out for them. And I think a lot of it is children grow through osmosis. They really do. And so a lot of it is by letting them observe how we behave. And so, yeah. you know, my wife and I both take time out each day to meditate and we let them see that. Now, they don't necessarily, my, my daughter comes to yoga with me and she does meditate at times. Uh, my son's got no interest in it. So you can't, and you, know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And look, I wasn't yeah. meditating at that age, so sure. I don't expect them to either. So, yeah. Well, well, Jody actually did say that modelling, which is exactly what you just said, is, yeah. is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not just for our children, it's for friends, colleagues, anyone. You know, I've got a, a man of mine that's really stressed about his partner. And I said, well, look, you know, do you, are you representing the ideal scenario that you want her to sort of um, adapt and embrace, uh, adopt and embrace? And he wasn't. I'm like, well, if she's got no guide, if she's got no, no one to sort of show her what's an alternative, then how does she know how to get there? So, you know, we have to kind of be the world we want. What is the saying that I think was Gandhi, you know, be the world you want to see changed or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, modelling is it. And, and, and actually extricating the technology from the bedroom because sleep is such a big issue in health 
and with uh, 24-7 connection, literally, um, well, you know, that must be hard. Is, are there rules around that in the house? Yeah, we do. I mean, we turn off our, our Wi-Fi modem every night. We turn off our, all our phones, go into airplane mode. Um, you know, we did have a rule up to a certain age where the children had to leave their phones in, in the kitchen uh, overnight. My daughter still leaves hers out of her bedroom. She doesn't want in her room at night. So all of us put our phones. My son, I'm not too sure about him, but we'll, we'll, he knows he knows the importance of turning it off and not getting on it. So yeah. uh, he, he assures me that he's pretty good with it. Yeah. Now, and you've got so many things going. Going, Tom, you know, this this movie coming out and and the teen. Pro- Tell us about the Stillness Project. Yeah, the Stillness Project really was a vision I had uh, about seven years ago when I you know became a meditation teacher. And when I first started meditating, you got to remember that there was no internet, and the only way you could learn to meditate was literally the technique that I learned anyway was to sit with a teacher in the locality of that teacher that's in their space and learn from them. And it was quite expensive. You know, it's, you know, this technique isn't, isn't a cheap technique to learn. Um, but what I found was when I started blogging and doing videos on YouTube, the internet arrived and I could reach all corners of the world and people all over the world started asking me, you know, how did I heal my depression, my anxiety and panic attacks? And I told them it was through this meditation technique and people would like literally begging me to teach them. And I, I had this conundrum where I was faced with, preserving this ancient tradition or giving these people access to a, a modality of learning a form of de excitation and, and, you know, reorganization in their body um, that didn't involve me, you know, having to be there with them every day. So that's when I created an online program called Fast Deeper Bliss, which was a, an adult's version of this online program, a 21-day video program. And um, and then the Stillness Project was kind of born out of that with this vision to inspire a billion people to meditate daily and make meditation available to the masses and inspire the masses to make it part of their lives. So that really was the Stillness Project, was to get stillness into the lives of people all over the world. And, you know, it's a, it's a vision that we still are, you know, unraveling and folding out to this day. What a thought, a uh, billion people meditating every day and that's the global i guess that's the global meditation that you speak of yeah you know i just figured that if we want to see change in the world we have to shift our state of consciousness and we have to do that not just one two or three people we really have to do it in a big way otherwise we're really going to keep doing the same things over and over again and and not seeing a different result and and that's the kind of trajectory that we're kind of on we keep doing the same thing and i don't think it's a great path that we're going to keep walking if we keep walking that path it's a great thing to aspire to to get us all doing it and getting imagine that energy yeah you know i, I think it's um it'd be great to see i i i one daniel schmachtenberg in the film he uh he said he contemplated life like on an enlightened planet and i kind of think that would be quite an amazing thing to aspire to as a species collectively if we all started to contemplate what that might look like um, look, uh, we're going to really – we'll have links to your, um, you know, the, the site for those online courses and also to the movie. I know there's a book associated with it as well. Just mm-hmm. wondered if we might just take a step back for a moment and, you know, I just want to finish up. Well, it, we're all on this health journey together. I think you've identified some of the challenges, but what do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey in life through our modern world? You know, health is – it's an ongoing – balancing act and you know we have to navigate that on a literally daily basis on an hourly basis you know for me i'm really listening into my body and i'm I'm a lot more tuned into my body these days because my mind is much quieter so i can really feel the subtlety within my body about what it needs what our greatest challenge is we generally have very dictated and busy minds when I say dictators, that the minds are programmed to think in a particular way. You you should go to the pub after work or you should do this or you should do that. And we have this indoctrination and this programming that puts us on this automatic pilot. And we have this very, in, you know, poor ability to tune into what our body actually really needs. And when we meditate, what happens is we, we're able to listen a lot more to that body. Like if I'm tired at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, I have the the ability and the blessing of the nature of my job that I can go and have a nap or I'll go and meditate. Um, even when I was a broker, you know, I would go and have a nap in the park if I was tired. And it's about listening to my body and listening to what it needs um, and tuning into what food it needs and what supplements it needs. But most of us have just got this busy mind and we don't, we're not able to see the wood through the trees. And that's part of the problem, I think. 
Mm. That's a great message to leave our listener with. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom, and we'll have links to all of those things that you've got going. They sound the, – the trailer looks amazing. I'm really looking forward to seeing the movie, and um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me along. We will have links to Tom's webpage and all his programs, and, of course, his new film, The Portal, is one that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Now, don't forget, we have our own Unstress app which you can get from the uh, App Store or Google Play, and it's got some great resources on it. So have a look at that. We've also got some exciting new programs coming up, so watch out for that as well. Now, please don't forget to go onto iTunes and leave us a review. I'm just getting my head around promotion, and apparently if you get up to 100 reviews, the profile of your podcast is elevated significantly. And I would love this podcast to reach tens of thousands of people. Well, maybe even hundreds of thousands or millions. Who knows? I hope you agree that the subjects we cover are important ones for your health and the health of the planet. And as you know, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, the two are inseparable. I hope you agree that that's an important message to share with lots and lots of people. So, until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests.